and they'll try and identify good and bad bacteria and then recommend a diet based on that. But what they'll almost always say is, I eat less and eat more plant-based food. <laughs> <laughs> so you could save yourself a few hundred dollars by just doing that in the first place. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's got a lot of potential in the future. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I had the great pleasure of chatting with Professor David Julian McClements, a distinguished professor at the Department of Food Science at the University of Massachusetts. His research uses the basic principles of physics, chemistry and biology to improve the quality, healthiness, safety and sustainability of the modern food supply. He is also the author of the book Future Foods, How Modern Science is Transforming the Way We Eat, so I hope you enjoy the following discussion. So hi, Julian. Thank you very much for joining me today and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you. So um, last year I read your book, Future Foods, um, How Modern Science is Transforming the Way We Eat. And I learned so much about um, food itself and how it's affecting and how we can understand it to alter the modern food supply. And beyond that, to you yourself are a researcher and have been in this field for a long time. And I believe you're the most cited researcher in food sciences, which is just really impressive. So you also have a wealth of knowledge, which hopefully we'll try and unpack a bit of it um, today in this discussion. And so I guess before we jump into looking at how we can understand the nutritional value of foods and how we can um, improve both the quality of foods and also the sustainability, an important question to address first is, well, what actually is a food scientist? Yeah, so a food scientist is somebody who applies you know, basic sciences to try and um, make food, make the food supply sort of safer, uh, more affordable, um, more delicious, uh, more abundant, you know, and, and to address all the issues around food. So we use things like physics and chemistry and biology and psychology and, you know, any kind of science that is related to food. So for me, it's a really exciting area to be in as a scientist because it's so relevant to your life and there's so many different aspects to it. You know, ranging from understanding the interactions between individual molecules to understanding, you know, how it breaks down in your body, uh, you know, and how it, how it feels in your mouth and then how that affects your, your brain and your physiology and, and ultimately your health, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so also there's a lot of different attributes to a food as opposed to what actually makes up a food to the texture of a food, how it, what happens to it when it gets digested, as you just mentioned. And I think one kind of key concept we should try and distinguish at the moment before we talk about other uh, concepts later on is, what is the difference between nutrients, vitamins, and nutraceuticals? Yeah, so, uh, so I think a nutrient is, I think, could either be like macronutrients, so that would be like proteins, the carbohydrates, and fat. So they're the, you know, sort of, they're present in quite large quantities in your food. And they really provide, mainly provide energy. But there's also some like essential amino acids and essential um, fatty acids that you need for your body to function properly because they can't make them. Uh, and then micronutrients would be vitamins and minerals. So these are typically present in very small quantities in foods, but they're absolutely critical for ensuring human health. And uh, again, your body can't synthesize them at enough concentration, so you have to get them from your diet. And then nutraceuticals are molecules that you find in sort of plants and animals. So things like curcumin or carotenoids or polyphenols um, that claim to have certain health benefits. So they may help you prevent heart disease or cancer or diabetes or something like that, but they're not absolutely critical to your health. So if you didn't eat them, you wouldn't die. Good. That's, yeah, I think that's helped to you know, um, resolve some confusion over those terms because I guess often you see people, I guess, use the word nutrients when they mean vitamins and yeah, they get mixed up quite common. And so obviously um, one of the reasons that attracted me to your book in the first place is kind of the fact that I love, I love food basically and I love cooking. And I think also being a scientist myself, I often find that the process of cooking is also very similar to being a scientist. You, you, know, you alter what it is you add into the recipe and then you kind of look at the results and then you can adjust different things. And it's similar to in a lab, you might, you know, mutate a gene and see what happens. I mean, it's not quite the same, but I feel like there's, there's definitely some overlap. And so obviously your area of work is looking at something called foods nanotechnology and how we can actually manipulate foods beyond what is normally found and actually try and improve um, some of the nutrients or vitamin availability in foods. So I guess the a question is, what actually is, Foods nanotechnology, and could you elaborate a bit on what it is that you, you research? 
Yeah, so, so food nanotechnology is really studying um, so our foods and other materials at a very, very small scale, so on a nanometer scale. So typically it's between like one nanometer and 100 nanometers. And that's a really, really tiny, tiny size, you know, like trillions of size smaller than us, you know, like you, you, we're used to. And by making things very, very small, they behave in very different ways than they would normally. So, for example, you know, if you, if you think of something like Ant-Man, you know, if you shrink Ant-Man to a tiny size, he can do things that he could never do normally. He can get into places he couldn't get there before or and he can do things he couldn't do before. Um, and it's the same with food ingredients, like by making, say, a vitamin loaded fat droplet, and we, if we nanosize it, we can make it much more bioavailable because when we make it much smaller, it gets digested much more quickly in our gastrointestinal tract, and that releases more of the vitamins, uh, and they can get absorbed more rapidly and more extensively into your body. So we do a lot of work in trying to increase bioavailability by making things very, very small. So if I understand, yeah, so you're yeah. trying to use the technology to improve, to make like kind of nano boosted foods, is that right? Yeah, so we're trying to sort of boost the bioavailability of the um, beneficial compounds in foods using nanotechnology. So for example, if you eat, we did some experiments recently with dietary supplements. So if you buy like carotenoids or um, from, the, from um, a chemist or something and, and you eat them, maybe only eat like 5% of what you actually eat goes into your body and the rest of it just goes straight through your body. But we've shown that when we put them into our sort of nanoparticles, like food grade nanoparticles, that you can boost that up to like 50 or 70%. So you get almost like a tenfold increase in the amount of the, these beneficial molecules that get into your body. And we've also shown that we can do it with natural fruits and vegetables. So if you take like a, um, a salad, for example, and you eat a salad, it's got lots of healthy molecules in called carotenoids. But if you just ate the salad on its own, hardly any of the molecules get into your body. Um, but if you eat it with one of our sort of nano-enabled salad dressings, you get a huge increase in the amount of these uh, carotenoids that get into your bloodstream and then can have the, the beneficial health effects. So I think I recently came across your TED talk where you use the example of carrots to explain this kind of concept. And so, uh, like, in, <laughs> including carrots, like, how exactly is the technology employed to actually be able to improve the bioavailability? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, what we would do is like you would look at like um, common food products. So you might say put a cream on an ice cream or some fruits and vegetables, or you might put a salad dressing on a salad, or you may have a cooking sauce, like a curry sauce that you're cooking vegetables in. So what we would do is we would make the, um, nano dro the, the droplets in these sauces and creams and dressings very, very small, and we would control their composition so that they get broken down quickly in your gastrointestinal tract and form these tiny little nanoparticles inside your body that can transport them in, into your gut where they can be absorbed. And so um, in terms of like seeing some of these products on like our shelves um, as we go to our weekly shopping, like where do you foresee um, this technology being used first or like what kind of stage of commercialization are you at? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of companies that will, we're working with now. So some companies are looking at um, like the TED talk is like eye health is like trying to encapsulate um, things like lutein and zeaxanthin, which are these carotenoids, which are known to be beneficial to eye health. So people are using the technology to make sure that they're in a bioavailable form. And the other where area we're doing a lot of work with is cannabis companies. So like in the, uh, in the United States, you know, cannabis is legal in a lot of different states and you can buy it as edibles. But one of the problems with edibles like chocolate is you get a very low increase in the cannabinoids in your bloodstream. And that can make you overeat the cannabinoids because you think, oh, I'm not getting an effect. I'll eat more and more. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And then you can get too high and you can feel really bad. Uh, so what we're trying to do is like put them into nanoparticles so they get absorbed very quickly into your bloodstream. So you get the effect straight away. So then you can have it like um, an alcoholic drink, you know, and you're going to get the, the, the same kind of re response from it. And it's not like smoking where you're going to get problems with lung cancer. Uh, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a better way to get them. So it could be for things like, you know, if you're trying to use THC to get a high, but also for, you know, um, CBD, if you're trying to do pain management, we can sort of structure these foods so you get either a rapid hit or you can get sustained release so that you get different effects depending on what you're trying to use them for. That's really interesting. Um, and so you kind of somewhat alluded to it, but how do you, in terms of trying to understand how it gets digested in the body, how do you actually mimic that process um, in the lab or do you go directly into model organisms and to patients? 
Yeah, so we start off with a like in vitro digestion model. So we simulate the mouth and the stomach and the small intestine using basically using test tubes and we control the temperature and the enzymes and the saliva, you know, so we simulate the saliva and the gastric juices and the small intestinal juices. Uh, and then we see how the food behaves uh, uh, along there. And, and we can measure what's called the bioaccessibility. So that's the amount that's in a form that can be absorbed. And then we might do things like cell cultures. So we would incubate the uh, digester in, in, on a cell culture and see how much of it got absorbed and, and how it might get metabolized by the enzymes in, in the cells. And then, you know, once we've I, you know, identified a, a good formulation, then we might test it using animal studies or human studies. Uh, so some of the, we did some studies recently with you know, students where we fed them salads with these um, sort of nano-enabled salad dressings. And this is where we saw these big increases in carotenoids in the bloodstream. Cool. Um, and so also, yeah, one of the reasons why you do testing is to also check for safety. And so are there any potential concerns we should be worried about in terms of this nano uh, technology? Yeah, I think with any new technology, you have to be really careful to test it properly. And I think especially with the food industry, because... Um, you know, people, you know, millions and millions of people are eating foods every day. So if you do make a mistake, it has really profound implications. So, you know, we do do sort of toxicology studies as well, using cell cultures and, and uh, animal studies to make sure that, you know, that the technology you develop are, you know, are going to be healthy and not cause any adverse effects. So, I mean, some of the effects that you could have, for example, with um, carotenoids, there was some studies showing that if you give people high doses of carotenoids, uh, if they're smokers, it can actually promote cancer, you know, because, uh, um, you know, you get it somehow enhances the free radicals that are generated in your body uh, because there's so, there's so many free radicals there at the beginning. So for that population, you wouldn't want to give these kind of systems because if you're really boosting the bioavailability. And then if you're using like solid nanoparticles, so things like titanium dioxide, they can they could get into your cells and maybe accumulate in your cells uh, and, and have some adverse effects. So it, it is really important to study this stuff. And so I guess you, you kind of raised an interesting question that I was going to ask later on, but it makes sense to ask now, which is um, personalized nutrition and how actually it's probably important to consider differences in terms of our genetics and I guess our environmental setting as to what foods might be best to eat um, and the quantities. And so, I mean, what, what do you think we'll see in terms of personalized nutrition in the future? Yeah, it's a really rapidly growing area. And I think the science is still really at the beginning because it's such a complicated area. Um, you know, so I think traditionally foods were just designed for a general population. But I think, you know, now there's increasing evidence that all, we've all got, you know, our own genetic sequences. We've all got the, the, the genes are expressed differently depending on your lifestyle. We have different microbiomes. We have different bacteria that are living in, in, our, um, in our guts and they metabolize foods differently and produce different types of products. Uh, and then, you know, some people might be active, some are non-active, some people may have diabetes, some have heart disease, some have uh, hypertension. So we really, if we can design specific diets for specific people, then we may be able to, you know, ameliorate some of the adverse effects, you know, uh, health effects that might happen throughout your life. And that could, you know, could improve people's quality of life and reduce healthcare costs in the long run. And so you mentioned one of my favorite words there, which is microbiome. And so how do you take that into account in terms of doing these uh, studies? Or is that something that, um, like, it's, I guess, it's, yeah, I, I, how do you use that understanding to design feeds and understand the digestion? Yeah, I mean, the microbiome is incredibly complicated. Again, you know, it's, you know, it's like a, a jungle where you've got all these different animals, you know, you've got like lions and tigers and birds and insects and stuff, and they're all interacting with each other in this ecosystem. And that's the same inside your microbiome. You've got this really sort of complicated ecosystem. And we don't really understand what all of these different components are doing. And like, if you take one or two of them out, is that going to have a big effect on the overall environment or not? I mean, sometimes it does, you know, if it's, you can imagine in like a jungle, if it's like the predator at the top, if you take them out, that could have a really big effect. But if it's just some little mouse and that might have much less effect. So I think at the moment, we're just trying to understand on the, on the microbial level, you know, which are the really important um, microorganisms and how do they interact with each other, you know, and what's the dependence on them. So I think there's a, a lot of research going on in this area. And we have some professors in our department who are doing this where you see different foods and you can, you get some really interesting effects, for example, with things like curcumin, which, you know, it's got all these health effects. But as soon as it gets into your microbiome, it gets metabolized by the um, bacteria there and it changes to all sorts of different forms. 
and they'd be more, maybe more or less bioavailable or bioactive than the original form. So you really need to understand that if you need to understand how these nutraceuticals or other molecules behave in your body. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, from that, I've seen a lot of uh, like companies say that they can, I guess, measure your microbiome. And so um, I think I maybe read it in your book or maybe from elsewhere, but I believe that the way that they do that is normally from like a stool sample and like obviously our gut microbiome's in our gut. So is that really giving us a representation of like our own microbiome? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very hard to do. I mean, what you should really do is like bi- do biopsies because I think, you know, there, there are things that come out in, in your stool, <clears throat> you know, are probably not the ones that are residing, you know, remaining in there. But, so it gives you some idea of what's going on in, in, in your uh, colon, but it doesn't give you the complete picture. So again, I think it's a really emerging science. Um, and I think the, there's a lot of companies, especially in America, I don't know if it's the same in the UK, that, you know, you can send your stool, stool samples and they'll do a microbiome analysis. And they'll try and identify good and bad bacteria and then recommend a diet based on that. But what they'll almost always say is, like, eat less and eat more plant-based food. <laughs> <laughs> so you could save yourself a few hundred dollars by just doing that in the first place. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's got a lot of potential in the future. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I mean, I always find myself reading the latest uh, studies on the gut microbiome because they seem to just influence even like the brain due to all the different like uh, metabolites they produce themselves. So, I think, yeah, I think that's def- you're right. It's definitely going to be something uh, that I think would also influence the area of food design. So, yeah, I, think, going- yeah, Sorry, I think one thing I thought was really interesting about that was like, you know, there was one study saying, you know, it's like the microbiomes are really like doing brain control on you. Because, you know, depending on what bacteria they're, they actually want certain, like, more fat or something. So they'll produce hormones that will make you uh, get a lot of pleasure when you eat fat. So you'll eat more fat and then you'll get that population will grow. So I think that's interesting, this idea that your colon is controlling your mind. No, that is interesting, yeah, because I've had it be referred to as, like, your second brain. So it's almost like it takes over. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it wants. Yeah. Um, so besides, um, in terms of improving food's nutritional quality by using nanotechnology, another area, maybe perhaps with a bit more controversy over it, is the use of um, biotechnology to like genetically modify uh, different crops. And so I suppose like when I first was introduced the term back in like high school of like GM crops, I was also showing like newspaper articles saying like you know franken tomatoes and stuff but more recently i've seen a company that's developed um genetically modified salmon and i believe these salmon have like an additional copy of a growth hormone that basically means that they can grow all year round and so by doing this they have a better consistent abundance of salmon and they also don't have to give them antibiotics and things like that and so obviously as well as um there's evidence that it seems to be potentially safe. There's also improvements in the technology themselves in terms of like CRISPR and being able to sequence it, check there's no like off-target editing. And so I guess, yeah, my, my general question is, what are your thoughts around biotechnology and how do you foresee it being incorporated into our modern food supply? Yeah, and I think you know, that's one of the things I really learned from doing this book is, you know, I think I was quite skeptical about um, um, genetic engineering and stuff like that, and think, oh, it's bad for you and stuff. Like, you know, I live in a very liberal area in America and, 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 and in England, people are always going against genetic engineering. But like, when you actually read about it, you know, there's very little evidence that it has any adverse effects, and there's a lot of evidence that it has very beneficial effects. And I think, you know, as a scientist, you want to, you know, you want to ask questions and you know test things rigorously. And if the evidence suggests that, you know, there isn't adverse effects, then we should use any means we can to try and improve the, uh, the food supply. And, you know, and I think you mentioned the, the salmon, but there's lots of other examples, you know, where it can be, can be used. You know, it can improve the resilience of crops. It can, so they can withstand, you know, high salt levels or higher temperatures or more dry climates, which is really important if you're trying to deal with, you know, the effects of climate change. Um, it can be used to like improve the health profile of things like um, like soybeans. You get more omega-3 fatty acids in the soybeans, so they've genetically engineered those crops. And I think in America, we've been eating, you know, genetically engineered foods for decades, you know, and, you know, I think most of these sort of soybeans and corn and stuff like that is genetically engineered, and there's no evidence there's been any, you know, adverse health effects from it. So I think, we, you know, we should use any science that we can to solve the problems. And I think the problems are so big, you know, with global warming, um, you know, and, uh, and the devastation of you know, the bias, biodiversity and stuff like that. We just need to use every, every tool we can as long as it's safe. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good, uh, good point to raise. Like it's about just understanding 
what we can get from the literature and see the current data if it's safe or not and I guess yeah just have conversations about it um I think that's yeah it's just good to just track and monitor the process um and so now that we've got tools such as um nanotechnology and biotechnology I guess you can kind of we've got kind of a toolkit to try and boost the quality of foods and so um it was a couple of years ago, I actually wrote an essay that I entered for a prize. It didn't win, but um, I wrote it nonetheless. And it was about um, designing potential superfoods. And so I guess, um, do you think that there's a way that we could literally uh, even like kind of invent or design so-called superfoods or foods that, like if you, like what I mean by that is kind of like foods where um, when you used to get asked like, if you could eat one food for the rest of your, li of your life, what would it be kind of thing? Could we actually design a food that could actually do that? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we'd want to do that because I think, I mean, I was um, on a committee with um, uh, this uh, astronaut who used to be like the commander of the International Space Station. And he was saying that, you know, one of the, the worst things about being an astronaut is that, you, you, you know, the food is so bad. And I think you don't realize when you're on Earth and you've got all this different food available, you know, like how, how, how what an important role that plays in your life. You know, that sensory experience of having all these different flavors and tastes and fresh food and stuff like that. So they say, like, you know, when you're astronaut, you miss out on mush all the time. You get really depressed and you really miss that. So I think we'll, we'll always want different foods. But I think we can make sort of, you know, superfoods in the sense that we can make them much more healthier and sustainable if we can really understand the science behind you know, what, you know, how to get, you know, so what makes them look and feel and taste the way they do and then how they behave in the gastrointestinal tract and how we can control that so that we can reduce the fat and the sugar and the salt and we can improve, we can put all the good ingredients that um, can combat, you know, disease, you know, so the nutraceuticals and dietary fiber and that with, without adversely affecting their quality attributes uh, and then, you know, and then carry out experiments to prove that they actually work. I, mean, I think a great example is, you know, like the Impossible Burger and the, you know, Beyond Meat Burger, you know, like these are, you know, these plant-based foods. They're not superfoods in terms of like health, but in terms of sustainability, they are. You know, they have a huge, potentially have a huge impact on the environment if we can switch from eating these animal-based foods to plant-based ones. So I, now that you've brought it up, um, how exactly are these different foods made? Like how, how do they make them look so much like meats, but not meat at the same time? Yeah, I mean, again, it's th these materials. I don't think people realize, you know, how complicated foods are. You know, we have a really good polymer science department at UMass and they work with sort of synthetic polymers and they're always talking about how complicated they are, but they've got like one or two polymers in there. You know, when we've got foods, we've got hundreds of different molecules in all sorts of different forms that are interacting with each other. So we've got some, you know, small molecules, large molecules, colloidal particles, and there's all sorts of different forces holding them together. So I think that's where, you know, companies like Impossible Food and Beyond Meat have really sort of focused on understanding the fundamental science and then, you know, how can I understand what ingredients are there and what the interactions be are between them and then how that interacts with the feel and the taste, the look and the, and the mouth feel of the product. So some of the things they've done is like simulate the color so you can go from like a raw meat to a cooked meat. And in terms of Impossible Food, what they did is they said like in real meat, you have to have things like uh, hemoglobin which, you know, will change color when you heat it from like a reddy color to like a brownie color. And then they've identified a molecule in plants that does the same thing, so soybeans. But the problem in, soy, in the roots of soybeans, there's not enough of that to make the millions of burgers that you need, you know, to feed the, the, uh, the, the country. So what they've done is use genetic engineering of, of uh, yeast cells so that they can produce this, it's called leg hemoglobin, and then isolate, purify it, and put it into um, these plant-based burgers so you get the same flavor and um, color characteristic. So that's one trick, but there's lots of other tricks you have to do as well. That's really interesting. Um, and so obviously um, there's been actually quite, like at least to me, it feels like in the last few years, we've seen more and more of these uh, plant-based products, not only in like, uh, like you've mentioned, Impossible Foods, and I fully mix the two to cover that, but um, <laughs> um, there's also like just in the normal supermarkets, there's all these alternative plant-based food products. And so I, from the sustainability aspect, which we'll talk a bit more about later, I can I understand how great it is that we see these products now and that people are um, eating them. And obviously, I've also read that 
having a mainly plant-based diet is also good for your health and trying to reduce meat intake. But are there actually any concerns to eating these like designed plant-based foods in terms of maybe more salt or anything like that? Yeah, I think that, you know, there definitely is some concerns about it. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people criticize the, the current generation of plant-based foods because they, they seems like highly processed foods. So they do contain, you know, I mean, some of them, I was looking at one recently and they had some like 30 or 40 ingredients in like one of them, and a lot of them were not natural ingredients. So I think just because it's plant-based doesn't mean it's healthy for you. You know, you could go and eat loads of cakes and they're all plant-based, but they're, they're not going to, you know, improve your health. Um, so I think that's, I think the first generation of plant-based foods is really designed for improved sustainability. So they've, they're, they're designed to like sort of look, feel and taste like real products of people will buy them, especially meat eaters will buy them and incorporate them into the diet and have these sustainability benefits. But I think the next generation, we really need to think more about health as well. So we need to redesign them to make sure that there's not too much fat, sugar and salt in them and that they do have these beneficial components like some of the nutrients that you might be missing from a plant-based diet. So things like vitamin B12 or vitamin D. So if you eat these products, you're going to get that full nutritional profile that's going to keep you healthy. And so when you mentioned this kind of like second wave or second generation of products, like are these currently already being researched? Like how long do you think it'd be until we actually see some of them? Uh, I think that a number of companies are starting to do that. I know a lot more academics are doing it now. So we just did some work with um, some of my students are doing some work on sort of plant-based seafood and they just made these fantastic uh, scallops. I mean, I don't like seafood, but they made these scallops and look and, they, they look exactly like scallops and exactly the same texture as scallops. So they, I, they did a beautiful photograph on like with a plate and salads around them and you couldn't tell the difference. Oh, wow. And they, and they were only made from like, um, pea, basically they're made from peas and orange. <laughs> so they're, like, it's, uh, they're made from pea protein and pectin, which comes from citrus fruit. So, you know, from like these two, like I think there's, we had an enzyme to cross-link them as well, trans But from these three ingredients, you can make something that looks almost exactly like a, a scallop. So then you can address issues like sustainability, you know, from the seafood, like over, overfishing seafoods and things like that and pollution associated with that. But again, I think the next step is to try and make them, you know, make sure they taste the same and they behave the same way in your mouth, which is probably the more complicated um, step. Yeah, no, for certain. Um, I mean, it's already, I already think it's crazy that what they've produced is so similar. So yeah, to think that it could even get closer is just incredible to think about. But so I suppose in terms of sustainability, besides making plant-based alternatives, the alternative to that is to still have meat, but instead of getting it from actual livestock is to have so-called cultured meat or lab grown meat and you use uh, the example in your book I believe the company's called Eat Just and um, there's something about they they've created um, cultured um, meat which initially came from a chicken and so there was this chicken they had called Ian and they took they took uh, some cells from Ian and then they created these chicken nuggets and then they were eating the chicken nuggets whilst Ian was like walking about them. So I was just wondering, like, um, how does this process work? What are the steps involved in cultured meat? Yeah, so typically you have to isolate some cells, usually from a living animal, uh, and then you culture them in, usually, in, you could do it in a laboratory in a Petri dish, but usually we do it in a big fermentation tank industrially. Uh, and then, so you would put it in a broth that had the nutrients that the cells require to grow. So you have to do a lot of research to find out what those nutrients are. And then you need to add growth factors, uh, which are going to make the cells sort of grow, like divide and grow and multiply. And then typically you have to have some kind of uh, external force, which uh, stimulates them to sort of link together and form these like fibrous kind of structures that you would get in, in real meat. So I think one of the big challenges in that area has been to find suitable growth factors. So I think they use like something called bovine fetal serum, which you actually have to get from like, you know, um, a fetus that's come out of a cow. You have to put it open and get the blood from it. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously that's not suitable for vegetarians yeah. or vegans. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, yeah so it's just not a, a desirable way to get it. So I think what they're trying to do now is to find like plant-based alternatives uh, to, to, to obtain those kind of things. Well, obviously one of the, the things that kind of attracted me to this the, of um, of science is the fact that obviously I grow cells in the lab, like it's something I do all the time. And so obviously I know that actually doing this is quite expensive, like the having the incubators, using all the, the sterile equipment. Like how 
actually feasible is this approach going to be in the future? Are we going to be able to reduce the cost of this procedure? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's always been a, a big question. I think they're getting closer and closer to doing it. I mean, some companies that have just food from San Francisco claim that, you know, in the next couple of years or something, they're going to have, you know, commercial products that are economically viable. I think what they'll tend to do at the first is that they'll take like really high end expensive products um, because it, the costs are going to be a lot. So I think in Singapore, the, the, the government has just um, allowed um, um, cultured meat to be consumed. And I think there's a restaurant that actually sells it in Singapore now. So people are queuing up to buy this really expensive, I think it's a chicken kind of product that's been grown, you know, basically in a test tube. Um, so, so I think it will in the in the future. It probably will become economically viable. Ooh, but I, I, I imagine maybe on a small scale to start with. But if you look at how big the meat industry is, I think that's the challenge. Is like how do you like replace all this meat? Because that's the only way you're going to have a really big impact on the environment. Yeah, that's true. Um, and yeah, I guess if we want to have mainstream adoption to more sustainable options. It has to. We have to find some kind of way of reducing the cost, such that as a consumer, you would choose a product that is more affordable than um, the the actual meat option. So yeah, I think it's really important. But I suppose one of the interesting outcomes of this kind of cultured meat technique is like the kind of creepy idea that we could take our own cells and start growing them and create my own meats. And I, I do you want to elaborate a bit on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think I wrote about that in the book, but I think it was just like, it's a bit of a weird idea. But I think, you know, in principle you could do that. And like, would there be some, anything wrong with that? Like eating yourself, uh, you know, like, especially if you're a vegetarian, you know, like you're not harming anybody but yourself and you're not even harming yourself. But I wouldn't do it. I mean, I think I, I mean, at the moment, I don't even know if I would eat lab-grown meat, even though I'm a, but, you know, I'm a vegetarian and I know it would be much more sustainable. I think I'm just so used to not eating meat. Yeah. But there again, I would, eat, I would eat a plant-based meat, even if it tastes exactly like real meat. So it's strange, you know, like what makes you have those decisions? Well, actually talking about kind of like food perception um, and like how actually some of these changes will require us to like, I guess, surpass like previous conceptions about foods. And that brings on to the whole huge field of like gastrophysics and how there's more to food than just the food components and how it's digested. It's about how we smell foods and how we are, like as we mentioned earlier, the microbiome might be influencing what kind of foods we're, we're desiring. And so I believe, um, I, I learned from your book that around 85% of the flavor of a food actually doesn't come from like the taste. It comes from like just the aroma, the smell of it. And so it has the interesting implications that if we, want to like alter our perception to eat foods that maybe are healthier for us but we don't really want to eat it we could just maybe alter the smell of it such that we're like oh I really want to eat this healthy plate of foods because it just smells amazing like you can make it smell something that like a burger or something but you'd be really wanting to eat it like uh, is that something that's potentially possible in the future yeah I mean definitely people are looking into that so I think I mean the important things are like you're looking at the type of molecules that provide a particular smell you know, and it's, it's very complicated, you know, like, it's, you know, if you have like a strawberry smell, it's not one compound that makes it strawberry. I think it's like 30 or 40 or more compounds that really contribute to that strawberry smell. So I think you have to like look into nature and do like analysis using things like gas chromatography or mass spectrometry to find out what all the different molecules are and what the balance of those molecules are. And then you have to have people sniffing at the spectrometer to find out, you know, which of these flavors are important and which ones are not, and then you have to you know, be able to put those back into the, in, into the food system. And then it's also important, it's like how quickly they get released. Do they get released very fast or very slowly? So I think in the book, I use the example of like an orchestra. You know, you've got all these different um, instruments that are playing to create the overall sound, and it depends the timing of when, when each one of them plays. So you have to make sure that they all get to your nose at the right time to get that you know, like a meat flavor if you're doing a plant-based food or a fish flavor or something like that. So again, like all of these things are incredibly complicated and it involves, you know, fundamental chemistry and physics, but also sort of biology and, you know, um, psychology. So I think that's what makes it such an interesting area to work in, I think. Yeah, no, I literally think it must, like, you must cover pretty much every discipline of science, right? It's, it seems that way. <laughs> yeah. No, it isn't. You're doing something that we're all familiar with, you know, like something you, you, you might cook and eat every day. So that, that, that's what I love about it. Exactly. And um, I guess to continue on this 
um, area of like gastro physics, I've seen some interesting research where they combine food consumption with the use of either augmented reality or like virtual reality, whereby and I guess in a similar way to manipulating like the aroma of a food, you can alter what you see. So like you see, um, um, I think the example they have is just like a cup of coffee and or maybe it's tea. And the idea is it has the actual physical tea has no milk in it, but what they see is milky. And so they, they drink it thinking and it, you know, it altered their perception such that they assume that they're having just a normal cup of tea, but actually it's very different. And so, I mean, again, do you have any insights into this area of research? Yeah, only what I learned from writing that book, and I think it was like is it Professor Charles Spence, who does a lot of work, I think it's at University of Oxford in England. So uh, yeah, he does like a lot of fantastic work in that area. Um, but I think again, you know, that could be important for things like, you know, people maybe suffering from obesity. You know, maybe if you had something like that when you were eating, um, it looks like you're eating a lot, but you eat much less than you are, or the calorie density is much lower um, on the plate than it looks like. It looks really fatty or creamy in, in your eye. So, you know, like they, they, they could be really useful for certain things. I guess maybe another area um, where it could be useful is if we ever come to eating insects. I know you discussed that in your book as well. Um, like for me, I mean, I think of insects and I kind of shiver a little bit. But you also mentioned in your book that actually we're probably already eating insects. So could, could you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, and I think like if you go to the USDA, you know, United States Department of Agriculture website, and you look at different kind of food products, you can go through a whole list of food products, and it'll tell you like what's the maximum amount of say insect eggs or you know fly larvae or you know, body parts that you can have in each one. And you know something like tomatoes might have been like might be fifty legs or something like that. So I think you know we just we, you just don't want to look basically. So I think like one of the professional departments says she taught a class where she just opened a can of tomatoes and she put it under the microscope and you could just see lots and lots of insect parts in there. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so I guess in terms of um like why why would insects be a potential more sustainable option as opposed to uh, meats? Yeah, so I think you can. Um, they, they, first of all, they have a really good nutritional profile. Not all of them, but you know some of them have. You know, they're high in omega three fatty acids. They've got good quality protein in them. They've got lots of uh, vitamins and minerals in them. So you can get all the nutrients that you need, uh, similar to to me. Uh, then they can just be grown uh, in large numbers at a, you know at much. Um, lower environmental impacts. You need less water, less land use. Uh, there's less greenhouse gas emissions, less energy use overall. So there's a lot of you know advantages from a sustainability point of view. So I think that's what what the big motivation for eating these things is. And I think, like, as you said, I think the, the most the biggest hurdle is like this yuck factor. Is you know like it's, you know especially in, in the West, a lot of us just don't want to eat anything that's got insects in because you think it, it's you know it's dirty or it's bad or something. But as I think I said in the book, it's like already 2 billion people around the world just commonly eat insects. They don't even think about it. You know, they're completely fine with it. So I think we can, we can definitely change. So what would be the insects that have like the high nutritional quality? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's uh, is it mealworm. I think they're typically used a lot, but there's lots of other things like grasshoppers and, and other things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, used to, I have a, some packets in my office. I like uh, when I teach my future foods class, I bring some insects in and I, you know, I'll say to the students in the class, I'll have like two snacks behind my back. And you want to bring a really unhealthy snack that potentially could make you sick or you can make a much more healthy one. They're all, they're, let's have the healthy one. So I'll put the, uh, the crisps aside and take out the insect. And some of them are really brave and they'll eat them. Um, Cause they're, they've got nice flavors now. They've got like barbecue flavors or chocolate coated ones and all sorts of different ones. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see, um, yeah, I guess, what will happen in terms of that and how we can maybe alter our perception and maybe, or whether it is just going to be a kind of more of a, a novelty um, factor to eating insects. Um, so I guess like, I think another way you could do is kind of like grind them up and have them more as a flower so you wouldn't have to really like necessarily look at them if that was the, the main concern. Yeah, and we've done some work on that. It's like taking you know, insects and then you can break them down to different parts and you can use some of them as functional ingredients like emulsifiers or gelling agents. So yeah, you don't actually see it in the final product. It just looks like a regular food. Well, that's very really interesting. Yeah, because I, I mean, yeah, I think, it, yeah, that's, I don't know. I think insects affect people differently. Um, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, talking about, I guess, like future foods, like how are we going to be able to, to feed 
the growing population and like what where do you foresee like what foods are we going to be eating and let's say um, a shorter t- time scale and then like maybe by 2050 what do you think is going to be the norm for us to be eating yeah i think that i mean i think the most important thing i think in the short term is like switching to a plant-based diet so if we can get more and more people switching from eating you know sort of especially beef like you know sort of beef lamb pork chicken and eating plant-based foods I think that will be, you know, that will have a really major impact. Uh, and then again, I think using a lot of, you know, reducing waste. I think food waste is enormous. It's in like 30, 40% of the food we produce is waste. So like if we can try and reduce that as much as possible. Then making the agricultural system more efficient. So I think using a lot of automation. So we may have sort of robots that will, you know, like plant the, the foods and then monitor them over time and then, instead of just like watering everything every day or putting pesticides or fertilizers on every day, we, we do almost like personalized nutrition for the plants. So you look at like what each plant needs and you just give it what it needs to, to grow healthily and to get a high yield. So we can reduce a lot of the waste uh, and fertilizer use and pesticides use that way. And then I think using some of these biotechnology techniques like um, you know CRISPR and other kinds of gene editing to make plants more resilient and have better yields and better nutritional profiles. So um, you mentioned an interesting area, which is the kind of monitoring of the fees with robots. And I believe like that also kind of comes back a little bit to the nanotechnology and like how exactly is that incorporated into the, the, the crops and what exactly is it that they're monitoring? Yeah, so I think you can monitor all sorts of different things. I think, you know, they use a lot of spectroscopy methods um, to, and, and, use, you, you, and they can have them in satellites, which are, you know, like way up in the sky, or you can just have drones that will fly across, across the field, or even little robots that will sort of scurry across the ground. And you can, you know, like fire, like um, electromagnetic waves at, at the leaves or the stems, and you can get information about things like whether they've contaminated by, you know, um, toxins or by or they've been infested by insects or, you know, what their nutritional profile is at a particular time. And, you know, maybe like if we want to get high protein or omega-3, we should be using this kind of fertilizer or we can really discriminate what kind of pest or what kind of problem they've got so we can use, you know, this kind of pesticide. So you can be much more like precise about how you, how you treat the plants. Um, yeah, in terms of nanotechnology, we've done, you know, we've done some work on sort of nanopesticides where you, you, again, instead of having these great big particles with the, either the, uh, the antimicrobial thing, you can shrink them to tiny sizes and that means that they can get into like insects' bodies more easily and kill them more quickly. And we're trying to do that using like all natural antimicrobials, so things like essential oils. So essential oils are produced by plants naturally, secondary metabolites to protect themselves from insects and, and other kind of contamination. So we like isolate them and then create them into nanoparticles and then we can use them as natural fertilizers. Well, no, that's super interesting. Like I, yeah, I wasn't really aware of that. Um, that's, that's super cool. Um, so I guess in terms of talking about exciting advances, what is it that you would say you're most excited about? Like which area of research do you think is looking really cool? I think for me, I think, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of work with sort of bioavailability and delivery systems, but I think recently our, our labs really switched over to the sort of plant-based food area, because I think this is just like the most important area to have an impact. So we're like, we're trying to make, you know, plant-based egg, plant-based cheese, plant-based seafood, plant-based meat, plant-based milks, and to try and make them, you know, get the quality better and better. So what we really want is like, we want people who love meat or love fish or love cheese they've got these two products and they both taste exactly the same. You know, they both got the same cost, but one of them has been produced by animals and one hasn't. And if we can get to that stage and we can make people switch, then, we, you know, we can have a really big impact. But the is science that- is incredibly complicated, yeah, which is in- interesting. Yeah, because you mentioned eggs, right? And like, I mean, how, how do you go about trying to make a plant-based alternative for an egg? Because just like the whole process of the different ways you can cook them like they're just how how do you go about trying to solve that problem i'm trying to think like like again that couldn't be just so this is, we just had this this morning for breakfast this is like a plant-based egg um but so they've done a really good job of doing it but uh, what you can do is um you have to identify what the key proteins in sort of egg white and egg, egg yolk so things like ovalbumin and, and then when you heat them those proteins unfold and they become more hydrophobic and they all stick together and that's what makes it like form a gel. So what you try and do is you try and identify proteins in plants which will behave in a similar, similar fashion. 
Um, so uh, uh, what you really want is them to unfold at the same temperature because each protein t- it unfolds at different temperatures. So we've made some like reasonably good plant-based eggs that can uh, mimic the properties of you know real eggs. So you've spoken about the challenges of trying to create these um, plant-based food products. What are the other major challenges that you think is facing the the more mainstream adoption of plant-based alternatives? Uh, I think part of it's cultural, especially in America. I mean, I think, you know, we can't get people to take vaccines even if it's going to save their life. And I think some people think, you know, if you're eating plant-based foods, there's something wrong with you. You know, it's like it's something like maybe hippies do or liberals do. So I think it's trying to, you know, get over that sort of cultural barrier is going to be a really important thing. Uh, but I think, you know, if we can make really, really high quality products, you know, and make, make them cheaper, you know, and healthier, then I think, you know, you'll get more and more consumers doing that. And I think that it'll grow faster and faster. I mean, it's already a really fast growing area. Yeah, for certain. Think, yeah, and I think the other really important area is just, you know, there is a lot of problems with the food and, you know, the food supply in terms of, you know, that it's causing lots of health problems, especially, you know, obesity and diabetes, uh, but other diseases as well. So I think we really need to carefully think about what people actually eat and, you know, what are those foods that are causing those problems and how can we redesign them so people can still enjoy them and incorporate them in the diet, but they're not going to have the adverse health effects that they do. Exactly. Um, so um, to kind of more wrap up, I suppose, what kind of advice would you give? Um, I guess from two perspectives, one is a, like um, someone listening, wanting to try and eat more healthily. And then secondly, someone who's interested in, you know, becoming a food scientist themselves, like what kind of advice would you give? Yeah, so I think, you know, trying to eat healthily, I think, that, you know, I think the most important thing is to eat plant-based foods and trying to eat, you know, whole foods if you can. So it's like fruits, vegetables, you know, nuts, legumes and things like that, if you can. You know, if you use processed, eat processed food, that's fine, but you know, look at the label, you know, and just make sure there's not too much, you know, saturated fat and sugar and salt in there. And I think you become a food scientist, um, you know, I, I just sort of fell into it because I think my info did food science when I was uh, doing my A-levels and I had no clue what I wanted to do. And I thought, oh, it sounds interesting. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think we'd, we'd love to have you. It's just such an interesting area to work in. So if, you, if you're passionate about science and you're passionate about foods, I think food science is the, just the whole area is taking off incredibly at the moment. And I think you would have a really exciting career working in this area. And I think you'd really enjoy, you know, enjoy learning about it. And, you know, I'm continually learning all the time. I've done this for over 30 years and I'm still really excited about food science and the, the changes that are going on in this area. Thank you. That's really good advice. Um, and so if anyone wants to find out more information about your work or um, just the field in general, like um, where can I like help to direct them? Yeah, I think, you know, that Future Food Books, is, I think, is a good place to start just to see what's going on in general in, in the food area. Um, you can look at our, our website. I mean, if you're interested in plant-based foods, a Good Food Institute in America has a fantastic website where they have loads of uh, information about um, sort of cellular agriculture and um, lab-grown meat and plant-based foods uh, and all the different companies that are doing that and all the science behind it. So I think there's, there's a lot of places you can look now. And I think the BBC has some fantastic um, documentaries as well recently. Is it um, Follow the Food or something? It's a, bit, it's a really nice series that they had on recently. Oh, cool. I, I should probably check that out. I, I don't actually watch that much TV, but yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, and yeah, just thank you for coming on today. It's been great to, to pick your brain. Your, I mean, your knowledge is incredible. And I think what you're doing is so important in terms of trying to promote not just the nutritional value of foods, but also making it more sustainable, which I think we can all agree is a very important problem to try and solve for our futures. So yeah, just thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on. It's it's been a real pleasure doing it. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.